For millennia, going back through the Greek, Egyptian, and Vedic civilizations, the Aboriginals, the Mayan, the American Indians, and various tribal societies, back to the most ancient cave and rock art worldwide, we see proof that our ancestors had an intimate and extensive knowledge of both altered states of consciousness and the indigenous entheogenic plants which help induce them. Ayahuasca, ibogaine, peyote, magic mushrooms, and many other so-called psychedelics have long-standing histories, traditions, and entire religions based around these sacraments. Nowadays, due to intrusive and oppressive governments and their unlawful legal systems, the possession and use of most such entheogens has been outlawed, and along with these plants, the altered states of consciousness achieved by their ingestion have also become outlawed. In ancient societies and tribal cultures around the world, their entheogenic sacraments have been referred to with names such as the plant of souls, the vine of death, or the seeds of rebirth. They have often been symbolized by the phoenix rising from its own ashes, or the coiled serpent eating its own tail. This is because a strong dose of certain entheogens essentially puts you through the entire death and rebirth experience. Your soul slowly separates from your physical body, detaches from this physical reality, and gets a glimpse at the higher frequencies of the afterlife realm. Graham Hancock wrote, In the central African countries of Gabon, Cameroon, and Zaire, certain age-old ancestor cults still flourish in the 21st century. Their members share a common belief, based, they say, on direct experience, in the existence of a supernatural realm where the spirits of the dead may be contacted. Like some hypothetical dimension of quantum physics, this other world interpenetrates our own and yet cannot ordinarily be seen or verified by empirical tests. It is therefore a matter of great interest, with highly suggestive implications, that tribal shamans claim to have mastered a means through the consumption of a poisonous shrub known locally as aboka or iboga, by which humans may reach the other world and return alive. Michael Talbot wrote, that these inner regions have been well-traveled by shamanic peoples is evidenced by an experience anthropologist Michael Harner had among the Conobo Indians of the Peruvian Amazon. In 1960, the American Museum of Natural History sent Harner on a year-long expedition to study the Conobo, and while there, he asked the Amazonian natives to tell him about their religious beliefs. They told him that if he really wished to learn, he had to take a shamanic sacred drink made from a hallucinogenic plant known as ayahuasca, the soul vine. He agreed, and after drinking the bitter concoction, had an out-of-body experience, in which he traveled to a level of reality populated by what appeared to be the gods and devils of the Conobo's mythology. He saw demons with grinning crocodilian heads. He watched as an energy essence rose up out of his chest and floated toward a dragon-headed ship manned by Egyptian-style figures with blue jay heads, and he felt what they thought was the slow, advancing numbness of his own death. Is it possible that what we have been viewing as quaint folklore and charming but naive mythology are actually sophisticated accounts of the cartography of the subtler levels of reality? Kalwait, for one, believes the answer is an emphatic yes. In light of the revolutionary findings of recent research into the nature of dying and death, we can no longer look upon tribal religions and their ideas about the world of the dead as limited conceptions, he says. Rather, the shaman should be considered as a most up-to-date and knowledgeable psychologist. Whether through entheogens, dreams, meditation, chanting, fasting, rhythmic dancing, or drumming, sensory overload, or deprivation, the prerequisite for accessing the nether realms of the implicate order the key to so-called paranormal or supernatural abilities, always lies in altered states of consciousness. By using various methods to shift awareness from the typical five-sense physical realm, our minds are able to access these higher frequencies and facets of consciousness well known to our shamanic ancestors. Stanislav Graf wrote, Various techniques are used by a culture to expand the consciousness of an initiate by reducing or eliminating the psychological defenses that separate the world of the supernatural from the world of everyday reality. Such techniques include sleep deprivation, fasting, body mutilation, sonic and photic driving, 
social isolation, hyperactivity, group pressure, suggestion, and in some cases, psychedelic substances. Czech medical doctor and psychiatrist, Vision 97 award winner, and founder of transpersonal psychology, Stanislav Graf, has been working for the better part of five decades to improve the world's understanding of psychedelics. In his research, Dr. Graf distinguishes between two pillar states of consciousness he refers to as hylotropic and holotropic. The normal, everyday experience of consensus reality is hylotropic, whereas interpersonal states reflecting the wholeness and totality of existence are holotropic. In Vedic terms, Dr. Graf relates hylotropic consciousness to namarupa, name and form, the separate, individual, and ultimately illusory ego-self, while holotropic consciousness relates to Atman, Brahman, the soul essence and divine true nature of the self. Stanislav Graf wrote, All the cultures in human history, except the Western industrial civilization, have held holotropic states of consciousness in great esteem. They induced them whenever they wanted to connect to their deities, other dimensions of reality, and with the forces of nature. They also used them for diagnosing and healing, cultivation of extrasensory perception and artistic inspiration. They spent much time and energy to develop safe and effective ways of inducing them. In one of my early books, I suggested that the potential significance of LSD and other psychedelics for psychiatry and psychology was comparable to the value the microscope has for biology or the telescope has for astronomy. My later experience with psychedelics only confirmed this initial impression. These substances function as unspecific amplifiers that increase the cathexis, energetic charge, associated with the deep unconscious contents of the psyche and make them available for conscious processing. This unique property of psychedelics makes it possible to study psychological undercurrents that govern our experiences and behaviors to a depth that cannot be matched by any other method and tool available in modern mainstream psychiatry and psychology. In addition, it offers unique opportunities for healing of emotional and psychosomatic disorders, for positive personality transformation, and consciousness evolution. Since the 1970s, Dr. Groff has been using the psychedelic acid LSD with patients and volunteers in a clinical setting. The extraordinary results these sessions have had on people include curing psychopathy, narcissism, character disorders, and sexual deviations, overcoming addictions, alleviating physical or emotional pain, and dramatically changing concepts and attitudes toward death. In many cases, people had spontaneous glimpses of transpersonal collective consciousness during which their awareness expanded beyond the normal boundaries of the ego and experienced what it was like to be other living beings, animals, plants, and objects. More than just an out-of-body experience, the LSD often induced an into-someone-or-something-else's-body experience. Dr. Groff wrote, the common denominator of this otherwise rich and ramified group is the individual's feeling that his or her consciousness has expanded beyond the usual ego boundaries and has transcended the limitations of time and space. In normal or usual state of consciousness, individuals experience themselves as existing within the boundaries of the physical body, and their perception of the environment is restricted by the physically determined range of the exteroceptors. Both internal perception interoception, and perception of the environment, exteroception, are confined within the usual space-time boundaries. Under ordinary circumstances, individuals vividly perceive their present situation and their immediate environment. They recall past events and anticipate the future or fantasize about it. In transpersonal experiences occurring in psychedelic sessions, one or several of the above limitations appear to be transcended. In some instances, individuals experience loosening of their usual ego boundaries. Their consciousness and self-awareness seem to expand to include and encompass other people, as well as elements of the external world. They can also continue experiencing their own identities, but at a different time, in a different place, or in a different context. In yet other cases, people can experience a complete loss of their own ego identities, and feel full identification with the consciousness of some other individual, animal, or even inanimate object. Many of Dr. Groff's patients were able to tap into the consciousness of relatives, ancestors, and historical personages. For example, one woman experienced what it was like to be her own mother at age three, 
and relived a traumatic event from her childhood. She even gave such a precise description of her surroundings, the people, and the event, that it shocked her mother into admitting and confirming the incident, which she had never shared with anyone. Another one of Dr. Groff's patients suddenly became convinced she was a prehistoric reptile and provided intricate details about how it felt to have her consciousness contained in such a form, like how she found the patch of colored scales on the side of the male's heads to be sexually arousing, a fact later confirmed by zoologists as being an important mating trigger in certain reptiles. Another patient suddenly found themselves in ancient Egypt and gave a complete account of their techniques of embalming and mummification including specifics like the size and shape of mummy bandages, a list of all the materials used, and the form and meaning of the amulets and sepulchral boxes seen during Egyptian funeral services. Michael Talbot wrote, Other patients gave equally accurate descriptions of events that had befallen ancestors who had lived decades and even centuries before. Other experiences included the accessing of racial and collective memories, individuals of Slavic origin, experienced what it was like to participate in the conquests of Genghis Khan's Mongolian hordes, to dance in trance with the Kalahari Bushmen, to undergo the initiation rites of the Australian Aborigines, and to die as sacrificial victims of the Aztecs. And again, the descriptions frequently contained obscure historical facts and a degree of knowledge that was often completely at odds with the patient's education, race, and previous exposure to the subject. There did not seem to be any limit to what Groff's LSD subjects could tap into. They seemed capable of knowing what it was like to be every animal and even plant on the tree of evolution. They could experience what it was like to be a blood cell, an atom, a thermonuclear process inside the sun, the consciousness of the entire planet, and even the consciousness of the entire cosmos. In one remarkable case, Dr. Groff's patient found himself in a dimension inhabited by thousands of luminescent discarnate beings. One of them communicated with him telepathically and pleaded with him to contact a couple in the Morovian city of Kromeritz and tell them that their son Ladislav was well taken care of and doing just fine. He was even given their names, street address, and telephone number. When Dr. Graf himself called the number, he asked to speak with Ladislav, and the woman on the phone began to cry and said, Our son is not with us anymore. He passed away. We lost him three weeks ago. Stanislav Graf wrote, We are now beginning to learn that Western science might have been a little premature in making its condemning and condescending judgments about the ancient systems of thought. Reports describing subjective experiences of clinical death, if studied carefully and with an open mind, contain ample evidence that various eschatological mythologies represent actual maps of unusual states of consciousness experienced by dying individuals. Psychedelic research conducted in the last two decades has resulted in important phenomenological and neurophysiological data indicating that experiences involving complex mythological, religious, and mystical sequences before, during, and after death might well represent clinical reality. Shortly after his third LSD session, one of Dr. Groff's patients actually got into a bad accident during which he went through a typical near-death experience. Afterwards, he stated that he found the experience of actually dying to be extremely similar to his psychedelic experiences. He emphasized how glad he was to have had three LSD sessions before his accident because they were excellent training and preparation. Without the sessions, he said, I would have been scared by what was happening, but knowing these states, I was not afraid at all. Dr. Groff wrote, Individuals who have suffered through the death-rebirth phenomenon in their psychedelic sessions usually become open to the possibility that consciousness might be independent of the physical body and continue beyond the moment of clinical death. This insight can be quite different from, or even contrary to, previous religious and philosophical beliefs. Those who were previously convinced that death was the ultimate defeat and meant the end of any form of existence discovered various alternatives to this materialistic and pragmatic point of view they came to realize how little conclusive evidence there is for any authoritative opinion on this matter, and often began seeing death and dying as a cosmic voyage into the unknown. I have personally experimented with LSD and other entheogens periodically, and have always found the experiences to be very healing and transformative. They have shown me directly how consciousness can exist outside the physical body, how we can see and hear 
without using our eyes and ears. They have taken me deep into my subconscious, exposed the illusion of personal identity, and given me a momentary but timeless experience of perfect bliss, contentment, and complete at one with all that is. I remember telling my friend once during a mushroom trip, I can't believe there aren't whole religions based around this experience. Little did I know, there are indeed many religions throughout the world based around the ingestion of an entheogenic sacrament. Dr. Graf wrote, LSD subjects often arrive at the conclusion that no real boundaries exist between themselves and the rest of the universe. Everything appears to be part of a unified field of cosmic energy, and the boundaries of the individual are identical with the boundaries of existence itself. From this perspective, the distinction between the ordinary and the sacred disappears, and the individual, who essentially is the universe, becomes sacralized. The universe is seen as an ever-unfolding drama of endless adventures in consciousness, very much in the sense of the Hindu Leela, or divine play. Against the background of this infinitely complex and eternal cosmic drama, the fact of impending individual destruction seems to lose its tragic significance. In this situation, death as we frequently see it, the end of everything, the ultimate catastrophe, ceases to exist. It is now understood as a transition in consciousness, a shift to another level or form of existence. American medical doctor and psychiatrist Rick Strassman has been working diligently to improve our understanding of entheogens, specifically dimethyltryptamine, or DMT. In 1990, Dr. Strassman broke a 20-year prohibition on psychedelic experiments in America when he began his work giving intravenous doses of the world's strongest psychedelic to patients and volunteers. Like Dr. Groff's LSD subjects, Dr. Strassman's DMT subjects found the experience to be overwhelmingly positive with a myriad of long-term benefits. Dr. Strassman wrote, Volunteers reported a stronger sense of self, less fear of death, and greater appreciation of life. Some found they were better able to relax, and they pushed themselves a little less. Several volunteers drank less alcohol, or noted they were more sensitive to psychedelic drugs. Others believed with greater clarity that there are different levels of reality. DMT is such a powerful psychedelic that it completely melts away the veil of this reality and transports consciousness into an entirely other dimension occupied by everything from advice-giving telepathic rainbows to body-snatching demonic gremlins. Whether your eyes stay open or closed, these so-called hallucinations completely immerse and ensconce themselves into your consciousness, taking you out of your body and often out of this world. The effects then wear off after about 10 minutes when smoked, 30 minutes when injected, and after 3 or 4 hours when made into ayahuasca tea. Dr. Strassman's patients said in the long term their DMT experiences made them more open-minded and laid-back, caused their thoughts and feelings to be better integrated and overlap more, lessened their fear of death, and gave them a more real sense of connectedness to everything and everyone. One of his patients, named Alina, said, Most of my experiences fade with time. Not so with DMT. Outside me, not much is different. Inside, I rest in the comfort of knowing my soul is eternal and my consciousness endless. Another patient, Cleo, related how during her DMT trip, a cascading rainbow of colors telepathically communicated with her, telling her that she had been looking for God outside, but instead to go in, that God was in every cell of her body. The colors kept telling me things, but they were telling me things so I not only heard what I was seeing, but also felt it in my cells. I say felt, but it was like no other felt, more like a knowing that was happening in my cells, that God is in everything, and that we are all connected, and that God dances in every cell of life, and that every cell of life dances in God. I am changed. I will never be the same. To simply say this almost seems to lessen the experience. I don't think that anyone hearing or reading this can truly grasp what I felt, can really understand it deeply and completely. The euphoria goes on into eternity, and I am part of that eternity. Due to all the miraculous, revelatory, and otherworldly experiences shared by his DMT subjects, Dr. Strassman dubbed dimethyltryptamine the spirit molecule. 
the parallels between classic mystical or spiritual experiences and what people experienced with the spirit molecule were too similar to ignore. During both DMT trips and mystical experiences, time, space, and matter all become secondary to consciousness. The separation between self and non-self disappears, and personal identity fades into identification with all of existence. Past, present, and future all meld together into one timeless moment of eternity. Space is no longer here or there, but everywhere as one. There is only here, now, and travel happens at the speed of thought. Stanislav Grof wrote, In altered states of consciousness, this new perception of the world becomes dominant and compelling. It completely overrides the everyday illusion of Newtonian reality, where we seem to be skin-encapsulated egos existing in a world of separate beings and objects. In extreme forms of transpersonal perception, we can experience ourselves as the whole biosphere of our planet, or the entire material universe. Further to their revelatory and spiritual experiences, many of Dr. Strassman's patients also reported experiencing a typical NDE while under DMT. They felt themselves lift out of their bodies, saw and entered tunnels of light, heard celestial music, and encountered angels or light beings, felt absolute peace and painlessness, and were reluctant to come back into their bodies. For example, one of his patients, Willow, described her experience saying, First I saw a tunnel, or channel of light, off to the right. There was a sound like music, like a score, but unfamiliar to me, supporting the emotional tone of the events and drawing me in. There were large beings in the tunnel, on the right side, next to me. It was so much more real than life. I felt strongly, this is dying, and this is okay. I had a sense of dying, letting go and separating, after the beings in the tunnel helped me along. It's like a cosmic joke. If we all knew what was waiting for us, we'd all kill ourselves. That's why we stay in this form for so long, to figure that out. Everyone should try a high dose of DMT once. That place is so full and so complete. When I came back into my body, it was so heavy and so confining. Dr. Rick Strassman wrote, Her consciousness separated from her body. She moved rapidly through a tunnel or tunnels, toward a warm, loving, all-knowing white light. Beings helped her on the way, and some even threatened to drag her down. Beautiful music accompanied her on the early stages of the journey. Time and space lost all meaning. She was tempted not to return, but realized she needed to share the incredible information she received with this world. Her comment about everyone committing suicide if they knew how great the afterlife is points out another similarity between Willow's experiences and those of naturally occurring NDEs. That is, those who have had an NDE do not rush off to suicide. Rather, they reside in the knowledge that there is life after death, and that transition loses its sting. Thus, they are able to live life more fully, because the fear of death that drives so many to distraction is now so much less. As mentioned earlier, many entheogens have long been known to induce the death-rebirth experience, and none are stronger than DMT. Several of Dr. Strassman's patients reported experiencing phenomena similar to what is outlined in the Egyptian and Tibetan books of the dead, ancient texts regarding the process of death and the various states of consciousness the soul passes through on its afterlife journey. Elena shared that, More than once the DMT sessions gave me the gift of truly subjectively knowing the phenomenon described in Introductions to the Dead in the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Another of Dr. Strassman's patients, Eli, said, I was relaxed, and the environment began to change noticeably. I knew I was going through the first bardo of death, that I had been here many times before, and it was okay. I had broken out of time and space. I no longer fear death. It's like you're there one minute, and then you're somewhere else, and that's just how it is. These experiments are helping me in my reading of the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying. I know what it's like to be totally free. Another patient, Joseph, noted, I think the high dose is like death trauma. It knocks you out of your body. This would be a good drug for people in a hospice program or the terminally ill to have some acquaintance with. One of the most incredible facts about DMT is that it is endogenous to humans and produced by our pineal glands. The pineal gland, the only unpaired organ in the brain, is located at the geometric center of the head 
between the eyebrows. This mystical point, focused on during meditation, symbolized by the Hindu bindi, is what Descartes famously called the seat of the soul. It is also known as the third eye, because it can sense light, and in certain birds, amphibians, and reptiles, it even has a lens, cornea, and retina. So why is this death-rebirth-inducing, strongest psychedelic in the world produced inside our pineal glands? What exactly is its function? Dr. Strassman wrote, DMT is closely related to serotonin, the neurotransmitter that psychedelics affect so widely. The pharmacology of DMT is similar to that of other well-known psychedelics. It affects receptor sites for serotonin in much the same way that LSD, psilocybin, and mescaline do. These serotonin receptors are widespread throughout the body and can be found in blood vessels, muscle, glands, and skin. However, the brain is where DMT exerts its most interesting effects. There, sites rich in these DMT-sensitive serotonin receptors are involved in mood, perception, and thought. Although the brain denies access to most drugs and chemicals, it takes a particular and remarkable fancy to DMT. It is not stretching the truth to suggest that the brain hungers for it. In human embryos, the pineal gland becomes visible and releases its first burst of DMT 49 days after conception. This is also the exact moment when an embryo becomes a fetus and the gender of the baby is determined. At birth, there is another burst of DMT. Then regularly every night for the rest of our lives during REM sleep, our pineal glands excrete DMT and trip us out into various dream states. Finally, the last and largest DMT burst of our lives happens at the moment of physical death. Dr. Strassman wrote, The human pineal gland becomes visible in the developing fetus at seven weeks, or 49 days after conception. Of great interest to me, was finding out that this is nearly exactly the moment in which one can clearly see the first indication of male or female gender. Before this time, the sex of the fetus is indeterminate or unknown. Thus, the pineal gland and the most important differentiation of humanity, male and female gender, appear at the same time. When our individual life force enters our fetal body, the moment in which we become truly human, it passes through the pineal and triggers the first primordial flood of DMT. Later, at birth, the pineal releases more DMT. In some of us, pineal DMT mediates the pivotal experiences of deep meditation, psychosis, and near-death experiences. As we die, the life force leaves the body through the pineal gland, releasing another flood of this psychedelic spirit molecule. Traditional Chinese funerals are 49 days long. The Tibetan Book of the Dead states that it takes 49 days for a recently deceased soul to travel from one physical body into the next. It also contains 49 days worth of specific passages for friends and family to read aloud to assist the deceased in their transition. 49 days after Easter is Pentecost, the day when tongues of fire came into the temple and rested upon the heads of the elders. Symbolically, this could mean their crown chakras were illuminated, pineal glands functioning, and the spirit came down onto them, just as literally 49 days after conception, the fetal pineal gland begins functioning and the gender is determined. Are these 49s all just a coincidence, or is this mystical number the time it takes for deceased souls to reincarnate? The Catholic Church celebrates the Immaculate Conception on December 8th, exactly nine months before Mary's birthday, and celebrates the Incarnation of Christ on March 25th, exactly nine months before Christmas. Is this why the death and conception of Jesus can happen simultaneously? Because we are all reconceived, reincarnated, at the moment of our deaths, and 49 days later, our soul enters the embryo through a burst of pineal DMT? Dr. Strassman wrote, I already knew that the Tibetan Buddhist Book of the Dead teaches that it takes 49 days for the soul of the recently dead to reincarnate. That is, seven weeks from the time of death of one person elapses until the life forces rebirth into its next body. I remember very clearly, several years later, feeling the chill along my spine when reading my textbook of human fetal development, I discovered the same 49-day interval marking two landmark events in human embryo formation. It takes 49 days from conception 
for the first signs of the human pineal to appear. Forty-nine days is also when the fetus differentiates into male or female gender. Thus the soul's rebirth, the pineal, and the sexual organs all require forty-nine days before they manifest. Then, as we die, if near-death experiences are any indication, there is a profound shift in consciousness away from identification with the body. Pineal DMT makes available those particular non-embodied contents of consciousness. All the factors previously described combine for one final burst of DMT production, catecholamine release, decreased breakdown and increased formation of DMT, reduced anti-DMT, and decomposing pineal tissue. Therefore, it may be that the pineal is the most active organ in the body at the time of death. Might we say that the life force therefore exits the body through the pineal? It seems very likely that our souls enter and exit physical bodies via the pineal gland, third eye. Robert Monroe, Robert Bruce, and other out-of-body experts have reported the third eye as the main contact point, where consciousness enters or exits the physical body during OBEs. Several near-death experiencers talk about the silver cord, a long, bright, elastic cable of light which extends from the third eye of their physical body attached to their disembodied consciousness wherever it goes. René Descartes noticed he could only think one thought at a time and guessed it must be the pineal gland, the only singular, unpaired organ in the brain responsible for these singular, unpaired thoughts. He even went so far as to call it the seat of the soul, which certainly concurs with Dr. Strassman's findings. Both intravenous DMT injections and endogenous pineal DMT conclusively cause out-of-body, near-death experiences and play a key role in the birth-death process. Dr. Strassman wrote, While the release of neuroprotective compounds near death certainly is a useful response, the psychedelic side effects are not as obviously beneficial. We must therefore wonder, are these spiritual properties a coincidence, or do they have a purpose? I suggest that near-death chemicals released by the brain are psychedelic for this reason. They must be. It is similar to asking why there is silicon in computer chips. Silicon works. It does the job. Near-death brain products are psychedelic because those are the properties consciousness requires at that time. Psychedelic compounds released near death mediate consciousness exiting the body. This is their function, and this is what they do. DMT is a spirit molecule, just as silicon is a chip molecule. Rather than just causing the mind to feel as if it were leaving the body, DMT release is the means by which the mind senses the departure of the life force from it, the content of consciousness as it leaves the body. Stanislav Grof wrote, Activation and opening of the transpersonal area in the unconscious of dying individuals can have far-reaching consequences for their concepts of death, their attitudes toward the situation they are facing, and their abilities to accept physical mortality. Those who see themselves as an insignificant and impermanent speck of dust in an immense universe become open to the possibility that the dimensions of their own beings are commensurate with the macrocosm and microcosm. Consciousness here appears as a primary characteristic of existence, preceding matter and superordinated to it, rather than being a product of physiological processes in the brain. It seems to be quite plausible that consciousness and awareness are essentially independent of the gross matter of the body and brain, and will continue beyond the point of physical demise. This alternative is experienced in a way that is at least as complex, vivid, and self-evident as the perception of reality in usual states of consciousness. The transcendental impact of these experiences is usually stronger in those individuals who, prior to entering the transpersonal realms, went through the experience of ego death and rebirth. The memory that consciousness emerged intact from this seemingly final annihilation constitutes a powerful emotional and cognitive model for understanding the process of actual death.